Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 111 of The Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Pang, and we are going to talk about emails and pies. I can't wait. A new pie, a new year, everything is off to a good start. It is. So we first we have some follow-up and other small things. So I wanted to clear up something. I apparently, so first of all, I forget that people actually listen to this podcast, <laughs> which, which could cause problems, right? It's easy to forget that, yeah. And I have had two conversations in the past couple of weeks where people said, oh, I heard that you, when you're K, 24 runs out, when you are, um, you know, 57 or whatever, that you're going to retire. Did you, did we discuss that on the podcast? I, I mean, this is where at least one of the people said they heard it. And I was like, well, first of all, I didn't say that I was going to retire. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> It's like, I don't remember that, but it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. So, no, I'm not retiring. I think I was just had done that calculation in my head and realized that I would be 57 and that at that point in time, you have kind of, there's more of a, in a an insurance policy when you're that late in your career to really start trimming what you do to the things that you super, super enjoy because you just have to sustain it for a certain amount of time. So if everything peters out, you know, you don't need to diversify, have as diverse a portfolio at that point in time. So that was my only comment. Yeah. It's not about retiring. <laughs> All right. Well, we need to be more careful about what we say on this podcast now. Yeah. Now that, yeah, because people actually listen. We just need to flat out start lying, I think. Well, there's sort of a precedent for that these days. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're not retiring. I'm not retiring. Message received. Good. So the other thing, and hope this may be, hopefully it is a small thing, because email, oftentimes when you start talking about it, turns into not a small thing. But there are two experiences that I had that reminded me of a couple of email concepts, and I don't know whether we've really talked about these in any kind of explicit way. So one is... Um, the formal versus the casual emails. Yeah. And um, everyone knows they exist. But I've, I saw some really, like, well-done formal emailing in the last couple of weeks where I was impressed with the thought that went into, oh, I'm going to copy the dean on this. This is how I'm going to announce this. And um, it just made me realize that, if one is going to be a leader with a capital L, you really need to have that formal email game down pat. Okay. That's all. I mean, I think those skills can be very helpful at any point in your career because it's a way of, like in this particular email I was thinking about, there was like a new faculty hire that someone had made. And so they wanted to announce that this faculty hire had been made and make clear that the medical school leadership was aware of it. They attached this new faculty person's CV. Um, they went out of their way to thank the people who were on the search committee. And it communicated information to the right people at the right time, while also making the upper layers sort of understand, okay, I'm doing my job and look at this amazing person I hired, right, without being so overt about that. And then it also very publicly thanked people who helped with the search process. Like it, it was it was a work of art. Well, let me ask you this. How would one know if one were not doing that well? That's a good question. Well, maybe not how would one know, but how would, <laughs> what would be an example of of like an email that's not good in that sense? Let me just say that I feel like there's a certain subset of the faculty who uh, would see an email like that and immediately just move on to the next one. <laughs> oh, right. Like you can kind of sense the beginning of that email and know that like – well, I, I, part of the reason – you mentioned it already is that those emails are often directed at a number of people. And often it feels like none of those people is me. Oh, got it. Yes. Now, on the other hand, I often receive – emails kind of of that from quote unquote leadership uh, and do read them. So there must be some distinction between ones that are good and ones that are not good. <laughs> so 
But on the other hand, I, I feel like one of the things that's interesting, and I've done this myself a couple times, is that sometimes you send an email, like a formal email like that, to usually it's to more than one person. And uh, and it's like sometimes you send it to a person, but it's kind of meant for someone else. You know what I mean? Someone else on the CC list or whatever, you know? And it's like, and you want that person to kind of know, have certain information, but it's not like a direct kind of <laughs> address, Oh, right. You know yes. what I mean? I, yeah. I'm, trying yeah. To have, I'm having trouble a little kind of coming up with a good, a good example of this. But so anyway, so there can be like those kinds of emails have multiple targets sometimes. Right, right. Well, in this example, you know, obviously the people on the search committee knew this was a done deal. So it wasn't to them. Um, and um, but, you know, the dean was copied on it. And I think that he may not have been the sole person, but right. obviously it was important. Yeah to the sender that the dean see it. <laughs> like, I could imagine, you know, if you and I worked at the same place, uh, like I might send you an email kind of like updating you on some major research center, right? And like, and then CCing the dean or whatever. Like, and like, you know, you don't really need to know that because like I probably told you in person, right? Right, 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 um, right, right. But, but it's not like it would be weird for me to send an email directly to the dean, you know, about this. And so right, it's right. kind of there's kind of a strategic element there, and I'm not sure like how effective <laughs> that is, but I have done things like that in the past. And but but you have no sense of how effective they were. I mean, these outcomes are hard to measure. I think. I think they're hard to measure, but one thing that is notable, and it it's sort of maddening to me because I would love to sort of hang out in the world where your work speaks for itself. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and sadly, that's really not, there's no such world. It's not this world, at least. It's not this world. And so there are some people who are really good. Like, there's totally shameless self-promotion, right? Which I'm just uncomfortable with. Per, that's just my personality. But there's some people who are really good at making their presence known without the shameless self-promotion. And it may be that this is one mechanism, right? It's more that you, there's no reason that certain corners of your institution know what you're up to unless you happen to be present at meetings or appear at a certain meeting or they received a certain email or so on and so forth. So it's less about touting like a particular, oh, we published this paper, and it's more about, I think this email approach that you're talking about is more about um, having people, it's an advertising route, having people think of your name when something comes up. Oh, yeah, I got that email and Roger Pang is doing X, Y, and Z. Right. Um, because otherwise they would have no idea. Your name would never come up in that context. And maybe that's the answer to my question in terms of like what makes for a good uh, formal emailer which is that like on the one hand if, this, if one end of the spectrum is like you never say anything and or you only say like a little bit here and there and the other end of the spectrum is like flat out self-promotion at all times <laughs> um, then you kind of want to be somewhere in the middle there right right it also made me wonder whether when managing my p50 if i my email should have been more formal <laughs> well <laughs> we'll Too see if, we'll now. see if you get it <laughs> exactly all right and related to that and, and you mentioned this, but I wanted to, to be more explicit about this tangled web of who to copy and who to not, or who to BCC and who to not. Indeed, yes. Yeah, so the other thing that this reminded me of is I, and we've all had these, I've had multiple experiences where you're having a, an email discussion, dialogue, and there's more than one person involved, and then suddenly, like, one of the people is dropped off. And so I've had a reply where someone's dropped someone off and they were like, I think it'll be more efficient for us to sort this out and then go back to this person. Yeah. And um, so far it has not backfired. I can't think of any episode of this backfiring. But then it makes one wonder, like, when have you been dropped? When, you know, when have I been dropped from the copy because it was, you know, it was too fraught to deal with me? <laughs> right. Well, one strategy which sometimes which I have used and has been used on me <laughs> uh, which can be which can work if it's not like super tense um, is like if you want to drop someone off you can just let them know that you're dropping them off and then put them on the BCC 
Um, and so they, they get the email that they get the email that's like, I'm dropping you off, but that they don't get any follow ups from there. Right. The place I've used that most commonly is if you're someone introduces you by email right. to someone else, you move the introducer to BCC and you can say that. Right. And then and then they don't have to deal with the rest of the follow up. Yeah. Right. Right. But you've gotten an email saying, Roger, your input is causing wreaking havoc on our discussion and decision making. So we're moving you to BCC. I, I haven't gotten that. <laughs> And I'm not sure how I would feel if I did. I don't know. Right, right. Yeah. So I'm saying I think a lot of times, I think that happens maybe more frequently than I realized that it did. <laughs> and I may, and I may be, it may be happening to me too. Yeah. My general philosophy is that I'm, the more email chains that I'm dropped off of, the better, I think. I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you and I have different goals in life, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you also get to know, like some people just hang out on an email thread and you know that you need to, like, call them out if you need them to chime in. And that's okay. <laughs> that's usually me, right? <laughs> that's you. I'm like, Roger, can you chime in on this? We're at the point where we need to – it's a biostatistical emergency. Yeah, that was me last week. <laughs> yes. Well, no, I was, I was your auto-reply last week. That's right. <laughs> yes, I, do, I don't have an auto-reply on when I'm away, and so Elizabeth – takes care of that for me sometimes well, not, not really not really only when she's involved only when i'm involved and i need to tell the other people um guys roger's out and we're not going to hear from him and he doesn't have an auto reply so although you know it was okay so just to veer off topic a little i was uh at a conference last week um and it was the longest time i've ever been like out of like away for work ever like it's not this is not something that happens like all the time you know so it was just so maybe you needed an auto reply then. Yeah, I, well, you know, it was totally unfamiliar territory for me. So, because and were you planning on trying to answer emails while you were away, or had you just decided I'm I'm not going to? I did respond to some emails. I just didn't respond to not mine. Yeah, you didn't you didn't respond to mine. Well, it didn't seem like they needed responding. They were it was the problems were working themselves out. <laughs> were they? You you would watch us sort of like flounder with well. Yeah, there was because there was a lot of statistical discussion in an email, and usually email is a terrible place to do that. Yeah, well, that was the other issue. <laughs> Just like <laughs> I felt like if I, me replying would only make the problem worse. Yes. Well, we have a call tomorrow, so we're yeah. going to iron it all out. There you go. I have one more bit of follow up. Okay. Which is related to our discussion last time on like what is the uh, what was like what is the how do you know when you're working <laughs> kind of right and like. You know, whether it's – I think we have some discussion about um, – I, I I mentioned something about how, like, you know, we don't we never talk about how, like, professional athletes, like, work too hard, so to speak. Right, right. Or, or the other, And the other thing is, like, CEOs or right. – Right. Well, we did – so we did get an email from Carlos who said that uh, he was an athlete in high school before university. Uh-huh. Uh, and that, and this, you know, makes sense in retrospect, which is that, like, in the world of athletics, there's a general understanding that, like – your body can only take so much, right? Uh, and that you have to rest it every once in a while, right? Right. So you can't be like running 24 hours a day or you know, whatever it is, right? Um, and so there's an understanding built into the sport that like you need rest and they have to alternate between, you know, resting and, you know, working or whatever, um, which to me, you know, it makes sense, right? Uh, but when you have like, cog- that's like physical work, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But when you have like cognitive work, uh, there's no sense of like, well, you know, you need to rest. I think there's a growing sense of that. I agree. I think it's growing, but it's not right. at, at the point. It's not, we don't have the level of, I don't think we have the level of acceptance that you would have like if your body just gives out, right? Right, right. But we're starting to understand that like when you go and do something else, you often then some breakthrough happens when you, while you're thinking about another thing or doing another thing right. than work. And that you're often more refreshed when you, you know, revisit the problem after you've been away from it. You have a different insight. Yeah. And I imagine that there's an element, even in the physical world, of like, well, if I practice for an hour and, and, that, and my competitor practices for like an hour and a half, and they're like, then therefore they're a little bit better than I am, right? Well, then maybe I should practice for an hour and a half. And then it's like, oh, well, now they'll practice for two hours. And, you know, it's like, I think that could get unhealthy too, obviously. Right. 
and even though we even though you might have an understanding that like you overworking yourself physically is not good uh you might um ignore that just to kind of out compete someone yep so anyway bridging the physical and the cognitive world right there. right right and so in the professional musician world is there an analogy there's definitely something there also it's physical right so you can get very you can get injured if you practice too much i should have known that back when i took piano lessons for a year in sixth grade you should what, what should you have known i can't practice at all i might injure my fingers <laughs> that's right you gotta you gotta you gotta preserve your ability to play exactly yeah <laughs> i think most notably the you know, singers do that have to worry about that a lot right because they don't have mm-hmm. like a, an actual instrument except for their voice so they have right. to really protect that so the idea is that there's some optimum amount of work and if you're trying to think about optimizing elite performance right and that even if you're trying to optimize elite performance there is some point at which the recovery and the rest is important right yeah And, and we and we think that that probably applies to academia as well yeah yeah and i think just a one more thing on that i don't know i mean probably this has this is related to like physical work activity too but like i think for like cognitive jobs like i think actually i think sleep is actually really important yes so at least it, yeah i mean i think just anecdotally and i think there is some <laughs> actual science behind that too so should we move on to pet peeves or is this your pet peeve or my pet peeve this looks like yours yeah <laughs> okay you, you can't remember whether you wrote it down or not well it could be mine who knows right so uh i call this precision ridiculousness okay it's these like the the best example of it are is when people publish things or present things and they have these p-values that are like 0.456 as if you you know that you could be that precise in your p-value or um another thing might be you're reporting the mean height right and you you have like whatever 65.124 centimeters like it's just ridiculous. Well, if you had a co- if you had a cohort of like one million people, then yeah, then you could. Even so, like, what is that? What? How does that? You know, point oh oh one centimeter matter? Oh, why would you care? Yeah, that's a different. <laughs> yeah, question. yes, yeah. that's all. It's nothing profound. Okay. Are you with me on that or not really? Uh, uh, I am with you. I. It's not what I was. I thought your pet peeve was going to be, but I'm with oh. you. On that. Yeah. What do you think it was going to be? Um, something along the lines of. You know, I think in many scientific investigations that you and I deal with, there's many kind of aspects that, that of the investigation that need to be dealt with, whether it's like, you know, clinical assessment or environmental exposure or whatever. And like sometimes people can get focused on one specific aspect and try to be as precise as possible. And it's like, well, you know, you know, we don't really need to be that precise there because there's all these other errors that are like, you know, going to yes. dominate that. Well, so that's related. And I, I was thinking about going there. And then I thought, well, I'll just cut it off to sort of something that's more accessible. But um, and the, I think the example you raise is, um, I mean, it could be on either the exposure or the outcome side. But if a quality control metric for measuring allergen and settled dust um, that says that, you know, the assays working well in your lab or across, you know, multiple labs is that they're no more than 30% different than each other in terms of their result. And you go all crazy about whether someone collects the dust over one minute and 10 seconds or one minute and 15 seconds. Like... (laughs) That's not going to matter in the face of all the the imprecision of the assay. Anyway, I, I was thinking about that, but well, I've just been thinking about this particular topic recently, and I just think you know when you bring a bunch of people together who come from different backgrounds to work on a problem, uh, each one of them is trained to like maximize along their dimension or optimize along their dimension, you know. But the collection of individual people max like optimizing on their dimensions doesn't necessarily reach an optimal solution in the in right. the ag- you know for the the overall problem, and it's very right. hard to deal. With, it's very hard to kind of uh, what's the word to kind of compensate for that. I think because most people are not they're not trained to think. Well, let's 
to find the right set of trade offs between everybody involved. You know, like that's not right, what, right, right. You know, how right. The trained. more precise, the better, no matter what, no matter what the context is. Right. Yeah. No pet peeves from you? No pet peeves this week. Maybe that was oh, my pet peeve. That's so disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot piggyback on mine. Maybe this first topic is actually more of a pet peeve. Who knows? Okay. All you right. Can, you, can, you can be the judge. Well, first of all, the listeners should know that what is written in the notes, you know, we have an outline, the Roger Pang perspective, and the is capitalized. It's a capital That's T. Right. So as You'll if this is like, why. this is something very important happening here. So I am, uh, I think I mentioned before that I am teaching this class. I don't know if I mentioned that on the podcast, but I mentioned it to you. <laughs> I teach you this class. It's like a one quarter seminar on time series analysis, which is nothing special. But um, I've never taught this before, so I'm like writing up my notes. And um, I decided as I write up my notes, I would try to be organized about it. And I would put them in like a book format, right? So maybe in the future, I can, you know, flesh it out and actually publish a real book. Right now, it's just a bunch of notes, right? So I just had to like come up with like a, uh, you know, like a filler title um, for the book, just to have something there. And so the for the title I used uh what is it now? I think it's called The Roger Ta- pa- the Roger Pang Perspective. Time series analysis colon the Roger Pang Perspective. Right? Oh my god. <laughs> now but now my point is not that like that's what the title's gonna be, but my point of this is saying that I think that is the implicit title of every book that I write, right? I mean and any book that anybody writes. Right. Because it's like, what's the point of writing another book on some topic that already has like 1,000 books, right? Right. Uh, it's because it's like your perspective, right? And nobody can, nobody can say, well, I've already written your perspective <laughs> you know, already, right? Like, why are you writing another one, right? And so it's, you know, and what I mean by that, it's like it's the, this topic area filtered through your lens and through your experience uh, and through your set of priorities. Um, and that's kind of what makes it, original i guess Kid, are you able to i'm putting you on the spot here i think that maybe at the very start of my career i this would have that comment would have been confusing to me because i would have said well time series is time series is time series right like right it, it, like what do you mean there's a perspective about this isn't isn't there just sort of a set of marching orders or a protocol you follow and so maybe if you can can you explain a little bit more about how there can be different perspectives across something that is viewed as a science or a math? Or Well, I think the simplest way to explain this is like, you know, once a field reaches a certain age or size, um, it gets very big. And and also there are – and a topic like time series analysis, I think it's true for many areas, you know, has contributions from many different fields, right? So time series, you know, has a lot of engineering in it, but it also has a lot of econ- economics and there's a lot of like sociology, sociology and there's like, you know, kind of biostat types of contributions. So like a lot of areas are kind of independently developed in their own subfields. And so when you like decide, hey, you're going to teach a topic or you're going to write a book on something um, – you can't just regurgitate everything that's out there. It's too much, right? Uh, and so you have to prioritize and decide, well, what's going to come first? What's going to come? What's chapter one? What's chapter two? What's chapter three, right? Uh, and um, yeah, you could just copy what everyone else has in their book or whatever. But mm-hmm. uh, Or you could say, no, I think chapter one should focus on this area of the field and chapter two should be this. And, you know, I think sometimes some fields, like they're kind of done. It's like, yeah, there's really no way to improve on that. And some areas I think are more complex and I think could benefit from saying, well, if you're in public health, then these are the things that you need to know um, for doing like biomedical research as opposed to like if you're an electrical engineer, then these are the things that you need to know. And this is kind of what my, what, you know, so you can, so if you're, for example, if I'm in biostatistics, I could say, here's from my own experience, here's what I found were really important aspects of say time series analysis or whatever and uh, and these other things that you often see in these other textbooks i've never used them once (laughs) you know so um there's that element so the element of taking an area that is large and prioritizing what's the most important right 
but the but there's another layer too, I would think, which is in the end as naive, you know, it, it's very naive to think that really there is just one way to do things. Even once you prioritize them within, you know, if you've prioritized method A related to time series, there's still commentary about method A. Like, okay, people recommend it for this, but here are the limitations and so on and so forth. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Right. Like there's another layer down below just the prioritizing of the of the subtopics within the larger topic. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and then there's all kinds of like little details in terms of like how you present it and, you know, what, uh, you know, kind of like whether it's super detailed or very brief, you know, things like that, so. So are you going to stick, are you going to stick with that title? The Roger Pang perspective. <laughs> I dare, I dare you to. You know, I, maybe I could start a series. You know, kind of like the, you know, like the something, you know, the for dummies series. You know, like time series, the Roger Pang perspective. And I could do like uh-huh. biostatistics. You know, and I could just take a, take on every topic. Yeah. It, you could do kind of a some sort of A B experiment where you have that and don't have that part of the title, just to see how much your brand carries in terms of sales. <laughs> or you could even. You know, you could go head to head with one of your colleagues. No, you know, I think the ideal situation would be like to have a series of books that's like the Roger Peng perspective, but then written by someone else, and then it, <laughs> I don't have to like bother with it. You know, but and you'd be okay owning owning that perspective, whatever it was. Well, you know, I I would, I would have to exercise a little quality control, <laughs> uh, but you know. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have. So every just so you know, every book that I write. That's the if it doesn't have that in the title, it should be. And how was this potentially a pet peeve? Uh, I guess, I I, I guess the, <laughs> the pet peeve aspect would be. I think there are ne- perhaps people out there who are kind of like in the camp of what you describe as being naive in the sense that like you know a given topic area is is a purely objective set of knowledge, right? How can there be two ways to present it? Basically, mm-hmm. I don't think there are many people in that. Mm-hmm. Um, category, but I think there are a few. I thought your pet peeve was going to be that um, that there were people who actually put this sort of thing in their title. <laughs> I, I, I've never seen it, uh, but if someone out there has, I would be dying to see an example. <laughs> All right, should we move on to our next topic? Yes. So what I have down here is meeting strategy and prep. This is going to be some dark arts is what it's going to be. It is going to be dark arts. So... When did it first occur to you that for some meetings, some high stakes meetings, that you should sit down and actually think about your strategy and maybe do some background work? Like at what point in your in your either I mean it maybe it was a developmental milestone for you when you were like six, but um <laughs> Because I was going to say, at what point in your professional life did you realize this? I can't put a precise time on it. It's uh, probably somewhere in the associate professor years. Okay, so so I think we should pause there because that's I think that's common, right? That's the same for me, but that's probably far later than would have been useful. Uh, probably yeah. Well, I, I was going to say the I think the it happened. You know, I it didn't occur to me until like after. I had kind of been through a series of meetings where I feel like, well, it would have been better if like <laughs> I had had a strategy um, going in, I think. So I, mm-hmm. I think I had to learn my it – was, it was a little bit of experiential learning there, I think. Right, right. Sometimes that's the be- the most impactful kind of learning. Sure, yeah. I think um, – but – and so, yeah, so sometimes someone just telling you doesn't really have an impact uh, right. because you don't understand um, kind of what the point is. But go on. Well, so I wanted to talk about this in an explicit way, and I I don't think we have been super explicit about it before, but who knows? We're on the 111th episode, um, and particularly in the context of, of trainees or early career faculty, which the further that you get along in your career, at least for me, I forget that this isn't common sense because it seems like common sense to me now. But it it wasn't always common sense, right? And I think that's true for most people. I mean, you just said you figured this out when you were an associate professor. Yeah. And so sometimes if I know, like if if I'm preparing for a meeting that's coming up 
that's related to a mentee's research or what have you, their training. Um, I will say, so, you know, what is it that we want out of this meeting? What is it that you want out of the meeting? And, you know, how are you going to, what do you, what do you think is the best approach to walking away, having gotten certain questions answered, if that was your goal or strategy? Um, and, and oftentimes I met with like, oh, that didn't even occur to me. You know, I was just going to walk into the meeting. So I think that meeting strategy and prep is critical. Obviously not for all meetings, but certainly for higher stake ones. Yeah, I think one of the key elements there is kind of understanding what is the goal of the meeting for each person in the meeting, right? Um, And like not everyone has the same goal. Well, therein lies the problem. Yeah. (laughs) And well, I think so. Most important, of course, is what is your goal, right? Right. Or maybe a more subtle way to ask that question is like, what would you like your goal to be and is it achievable in this meeting? (laughs) I guess is one way to put it. Because sometimes I feel like you do have to attend the meeting for various purposes or reasons. Um, but and you have a certain goal that kind of that you want to achieve, but at this meeting it's not you're pretty sure it's not gonna happen. And so you don't have to invest a lot of time worrying about the meeting, right? That's true too. It helps you triage. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like or or you yeah. may just blow off the meeting for all, you know, yes. if it's yes. if it's that bad. So there's one element. I think but like understanding kind of like what why you're wa- why are you walking into a meeting? <laughs> I guess is question number one. Right. Why am I here? Yeah, and I think if you have trouble answering that question for, like, a lot of meetings, then you need to, like, reconsider, I think. Now, it doesn't have to be, like, I'm going into this meeting because I'm going to change the world, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a profound reason. And most of the time, it's not a profound reason. Yeah. I mean, it, it could range from um, it's important that I convey some piece of information to everybody in the room and they hear it all together. Because it's planting a seed for something you want to do down the road. Yeah. It, it could be that, you know, there's one small thing you want to accomplish, which is that you, you know, for me, I had one like this where I wanted to stop having standing meetings and just make them as needed. Uh huh. That was the goal of the meeting. Right. And I knew that there was going to be some resistance among certain, you know, group people in the meeting because they didn't want that. Sometimes you want to have a certain question answered by a specific right. person. I, sometimes you, you go to sometimes I go to a meeting because like I don't really care that much about the meeting itself, but I know like a certain person is going to be there, uh, and I want to talk to that person about something else. <laughs> That's a great point because usually you can have a brief discussion with them after the meeting, you know, for five minutes or whatever, as opposed yeah. to like a fifteen chain of like fifteen emails, right? Right. Right. You could just stalk. You could just stalk them, like outside the meeting room, and wait for them to emerge, and then you don't waste your whole time in the meeting. Yeah, well, I mean, if it's a meeting that well, I mean, if it's a meeting that you're not invited to, then yes, that's the only strategy. <laughs> but if you're invited to the meeting, then I feel like right. You know, it's a little weird if you don't show up, but then you're waiting that, outside. <laughs> that's true. Oh, look, there's Roger out there. Roger, come on in. Oh no, no, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for so and so when you know when she's done. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, are there specific kinds of things that you do? To I mean, I, I guess this is really any generic advice for preparing. I guess. Uh, I think it is. There are probably a set of core questions that I would have to that I'm just throwing out there on the fly. Like, what is your? And I think you. We've talked about them. Like, what is your objective of the meeting? What do you think other people's objectives are? And knowing the content matter and the people involved. What do you think the best strategy is for meeting your objective? And that strategy could include, um, you know, it could be that you're having, you know, that you're having the meeting to accomplish something where you decide, well, I'm just going to throw out this issue. I know how I want to solve it. And I'm going to let people figure out the conclusion on their own, right? And and I think because I'm going to set the problem up in a certain way that, you know, they're going to say we should do X, and that's what I, I think we should do, for example. Or you can um, – this is going into dark arts. I mean, certain people are going to be allies in the meeting as well, right? So if you have conversations beforehand, which is, 
you know, along the lines of, I'm really struggling because I need to do X and there's this one last piece. And, you know, I've been told by whatever, fill in the blank, that it's not possible to do X, but I really think it is if we go this way, but we're at a bit of a loggerheads. We're having this meeting and then that person maybe has a good relationship with with the party that seems like is the last, you know, obstacle to getting something done and can help move things forward. So there is like pre-meeting meetings and kind of the people <laughs> skills in the background too. It's not just yeah. about uh, there, like those two things, your objective and your strategy has to be informed by the people in the room. Right. And I think it, it's worth maybe saying that, you know, you can't have a strategy if you don't have an objective, right? <laughs> like yes. this, the point of the strategy is to achieve the objective, right? Right. right. So um, that's one thing. The other thing I would say is that I recently ha- I was talking to uh, someone and I came up with what I think is a theory of pre-meetings. Oh. Do you, do you care to hear it? Yeah, of course. So my, here's my theory. My theory is that like, if you live in a small organization, like let's say you have a tiny little department or whatever, right? Um, then like basically you kind of see each other. You see everyone in the department all the time, right? Either in the hallway or whatever, right? Um, and if decisions need to be made, they just kind of get made on the spot, right? I think the same is true at like, you know, small companies or whatever, right? As the organization grows, like you, you can't have all these like one-on-one meetings all the time. It's like not physically possible, right? So you schedule a meeting where everyone's in the room, right? Presumably to make some sort of decision. But often it's hard to make decisions in that setting because like not everyone wants to say what they really mean or how they really feel and things like that, right? And so you kind of have to like have a strategy for that meeting so that like everything's essentially decisions are already made when you get to the meeting, right? And the way mm-hmm. that you do that is you have the pre-meeting. And the whole point of the pre-meeting is that it involves fewer people. <laughs> well, this is, this is akin to like who gets dropped off the CC. Right, right. And I think the whole the, – the theory of the pre-meeting is that you want to get to the point that you were back when the organization was kind of really small, right? It's like essentially, you know, when you're really small, you're just out in the hallway making decisions all the time. But as – the organization grows, then you have to have a pre-meeting, which is kind of simulates that time where you only had a few people. Um, and then and then you can kind of make the decision in a small group and then kind of go forward as a block, essentially, right? Right. And that bigger group meeting is not about the decision-making. It's about managing all the different constituencies. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that's my theory. <laughs> that's interesting. Because I think there's a tendency to, you know, rightfully mock the idea of a pre-meeting, um, right. like the meeting for the meeting. But I think there's an element of like, well, we need to, like, if you have a group of, if you have a meeting of 20 people, like, you're not, it's just like, it's very unwieldy. And so it's just, um, there that the goal of the 20-person meeting is necessarily different from like maybe your goal with your colleagues or something like that. True. Yes. But sometimes you need a pre-meeting, even if the big meeting is only six people. Sure. Yeah. So the other meeting sort of scenario that I've come across is when, because I'm a closer, right? So I want to walk out of the meeting with some sort of decision having been made or something, <laughs> Yeah, is um, how to manage different personalities. And I think one of the personalities types that I struggle with a lot are uh people who like to hear themselves talk and they sort of wander off topic. There are lots of tangents and, um, and, and so if I'm running a meeting where you want everyone to ultimately come back to the original objective of the meetings and reach a consensus. And so you have to manage not only kind of people's own needs and, um, viewpoints and what their objectives are, but sometimes their personalities that underlie it um, that you need to manage as well. And having a strategy can help. <laughs> That's well said. Yes. Should we move on to the next topic? Sure. Intersecting pies. I'm dying to hear this one. So... The time pie is awesome, don't get me wrong, and I'm, I realize I mocked you the first time that you brought it up, So, but it doesn't necessarily tell you, um, it's not a tool for telling you whether it, if you take on A and you're going to reduce B, 
whether that fits with your overall career goals or mission. Right. Yeah. It's it kind of it's it doesn't really it's agnostic. <laughs> yes. I guess. Yeah. Yes. So it it occurred to me that a, so, you know if you have a certain amount of time during the week that's not committed to teaching or seeing patients or whatever serving on committees and you have a stated career goal you should figure out what percent of that other time should be spent on things that are directly related to achieving that goal okay and what per, and what percent you know could be allocated to things that may be of interest but there's not really a direct connection that you can see they're not you know there's no clear near term forwarding of your career goal do you know what do you know what you're advocating here what am i advocating a two dimensional pie chart yeah that's why i called it intersecting pies i knew there was you know well okay all right go on sorry okay well, so I haven't got. I mean, you're you're gonna like operationalize it into oh really a, fi- a figure. Oh yeah. So I don't know how it's gonna be operationalized, but you. So you have this time pie, but then you need this mission pie because if you take something on that drops your pre out, let's say you're gonna spend seventy five percent of that time on direct mission related work or you know forward furthering your career and you drop that below 75 percent because you've taken something on and the thing that you have that that is not mission direct that then you've reduced your mission direct activity and you know that could be a problem i have to admit i'm a little bit lost you are there's too many pies there are too many pies well, let's just figure. Let's look at the mission pie, right? Okay. Yeah. So let's say so, your mission pie is fifty percent research, I guess, right? Or what? What's an example of a mission? A mission might be that um, you want to build a puppet empire. Okay. Let's say fifty percent is for that. Well, no, no, no. We have to. And you have out of your work week, um, you want to devote 75% of your fr- free time. And what I mean by free is this is your unallocated time. You have a certain amount of time that's already taken up doing other things. That does not show up in the pie. Got it. The, the pie only reflects whatever, your 30 hours a week that you have estimated that you have control over how you spend that time. Okay. And so among, of that 30 hours a week, you're going to dedicate – 75% of that time to things that are directly related to the puppet empire. And then 25% of the time you'll, you, you have for other stuff. And let's say someone comes along and says, Roger, I really want you, know, you to write this grant. Well, you are then taking your 25% non-puppet uh, empire yes. time and you're increasing it. So you're decreasing your puppet empire time. Yes. And that's a problem. I can I think I understand it in the abstract. Oh wow. <laughs> but I I'm just I'm really grasping here. You are. Wow. It's it's yeah, it's it's uh you're limited in how much discretionary time you have and yeah. how you spend it. It's the same concept as the time pie except for that it is divvied up. It, 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 it's the concept is not is that the pie is restricted because you only have a certain amount of time, but it's classifying things in terms of what the objective is of those activities. So, is another way of saying this is that each slice of your time pie is like could have its own pie? Yes, or or it could have its own color, like it could be green for mission directed. Uh, directed or, yes okay yeah. so then there's like or, the size of the slice and the color of the slice yes yes yeah. and then it could be whatever black for just you know fully discretionary time that's not mission directed how did this uh how did this come up in your life <laughs> you're you're quite puzzled aren't you <laughs> i'm still gra- I'm, we're gonna have to follow up on this because like i can't oh, really you, i can't well, just like oh. conceive of it all all at one go wow 
that that's saying something. I must have like I don't know whether that's a that may be a bad thing, but I'm gonna pretend like that's a good thing. Like last time I talked about complex analysis, like complex analysis has nothing on this. Oh really? Wow. Um, so I've had these scenarios where, you know, someone will say someone earlier on in a career. You know, my goal is to really develop research skills and be a researcher primarily. And then the next week, they'll say, oh, I got asked to be on this, you know, clinical quality committee. I was thinking about doing it. Right. And there's this total – and so so then some people will say, like, well, do you have time? What would you take off your plate? No one will then say, not only, it's not just about, are you going to take this other thing off your plate? It's about like, well, are you taking something off your plate that was actually going to like, t- you have less time to write a K award now, and now you've replaced it by something that sure may have intangible benefits down the road, but it's totally unclear how it's going to help you in the next year. That I understand. Okay. So that made, made me think about the mission pie. I think the problem there, kind of, at least in that particular example is that often there's a latent mission Mm -hmm. that people kind of have in the back of their minds. Mm -hmm. Uh, And often because it's like a more general mission, which makes it life a little bit, seem a little easier. Like, like it may be that like you say, my goal is to develop a research program. Right. Mm -hmm. But your latent goal might be, well, I just want to get promoted, you know, to associate professor. Right. Right. In the, in the land, of the closer, you cannot have latent missions. Well, they get in the way. Yeah. But the problem with the latent mission is that it's more general, right? And so you could say, well, this clinical committee, you know, it's going to help me get promoted. Right. Uh, whereas the research, I mean, the research program would also help too, but that seems like a lot harder. Right? Um, anyway, I think, I feel like I've seen this a number of times where like you might say that this is one goal, but there's a more, I mean, it's not like it's a, it's bad to have more than one goal, right? Um but uh, it's but hard. The to, mission, yeah. the mission pie might let help you visualize that. <laughs> if only it were something it could be visualized. <laughs> it, it is something you could visualize. You'll have to draw me a picture. Okay, I'll I'll draw you a picture. Although, can I can I say something pie chart related that's not related to this topic, but it's related to pie charts? That that's allowed. Yes. Uh, at this conference that I was just at, uh, which is the uh, R Studio conference. The one of the keynote speakers was uh, a pair of people from Google uh, who are like visualization experts. And they gave a really nice talk. Um, and uh, it was Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Villegas. And somewhere in the middle of their talk, they had, uh, it is, remember, this is a, a talk about data visualization, right? And they're supposed uh-huh. to be the experts, right? Um, somewhere in the talk, they had a pie chart. And, uh, and after the keynote was done, they were taking questions. And the very first question, as you might imagine, <laughs> was mm-hmm. why pie charts, right? Mm-hmm. And the, one of the speakers just like launched back and said, I love pie charts. They are amazing. Wow. Like with, in full force, like no hesitation. They owned it. Owned it 1,000%. And I think and the, and the rationale was basically... Pie charts were invented in like 1912 or, you know, whatever, 100 years ago, and they've never gone away. There must be something to them. <laughs> like, people have tried to kill the pie chart for literally decades, and it's never happened. And where do you stand on that? I, uh, I think I lead in the direction of pie charts, I think. I think, you know, I, I know I kind of stand alone on this, especially in the field of statistics, but um, I, I find that they have an intuitive appeal. All right. So next paper you publish, I want to see a pie chart in it. Well, well, it, only if it's warranted. It's not like you know. It's not like a hammer and everything's a nail, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every tool for its purpose, right? So, so not not gratuitous pie charts. Well, I wouldn't want gratuitous anything, right? So, right, right. Yeah, even a scatter plot can be used gratuitously. True. Should we go to the weekly grind? Okay. You go first. Uh, I can't because I'm not prepared. That's what it comes down to. I, well, I, okay. The oh. other thing I could, I, it's easy for me. I was at a conference all week, so <laughs> like <laughs> I've just been conferencing. And you and you keynoted. I keynoted, yes. Your other podcast, right, had a lot for the keynote. Had a live 
episode recorded. Yes, we did our first ever live episode actually. So it, wow. it, so our podcast has had two live episodes already. Well, we're advanced. Yeah. So my other podcast, Not So Standard Deviations, has never done a live episode. So we did it for the first time. It was our hundredth episode. And there were like two thousand people in the audience. <laughs> It was wow. kind of yeah, and it was like live streamed and everything. Um, you were wearing you were wearing like a sport coat, a blazer. I was wearing a jacket. Well, I, I, what do yeah. you mean? I, I, I don't know. My my daughter texted me and said Roger's wearing like a. <laughs> She's never seen me so dressed dressed up before. I guess yeah. so. Yes. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, you know, I was uh, trying to look nice, and um, it was weird because we had like you know like real microphones, and it was like a whole uh, AV thing set up, and uh, it was like a professional thing. And you were, and it was very techy. I wanted to see like ferns and. <laughs> yeah. The, the one thing that wasn't the case is you didn't have those weird microphones that are like, you know, the headset things that have the little. Well, I didn't because I had like a lapel mic, but uh, right. my partner Hillary, she did actually. So she had her oh, like tech didn't... crunch disrupt like headset uh, microphone. It was hard to uh-huh. see, I think, from a distance, but uh, yeah, she had the whole look. Yeah. Wow. That sounds fun. It was fun, yeah, and it's um, it's like it's really like, you know, there's a lot going on because also we were like playing audio clips of like previous episodes of the podcast, so like uh-huh. I had a lot to manage, <laughs> and so like it was like a blur. Like I don't remember, I barely remember anything uh, from the whole experience because like you know, you're trying to like manage the time because you only have exactly one hour, and it's like. Um, and you want to hit, make sure you hit all the topics that you're trying to hit. And it was like, it was way more like planned out than it normally is. And so, um, it was a little way more stressful as a result. And so like, I was just like, I barely recall like what was said. I've, I've got to like listen to it to, to hear what we said. To remember? Basically. Yeah. It required every neuron. Almost all of them. Yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah. So what did I do while you were keynoting textile? <laughs> I went to an appointment, promotions, and tenure committee meeting. Are you on this committee? I am on this committee. Is that a recent thing, or have you been on it for a while? Um, I have been on it for maybe three or four months. Okay. And this is like within the medical school or within the university? Within the medical school. Okay. And I have this sort of funny tale about it. I don't know whether this is true. I'm just speculating which is that um, I got an email asking me to be on it. And I was like, okay, sure. I d- did not consult my time pie or my mission pie, apparently. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. So, and it's actually been, you know, kind of interesting because the medical school is new. And they had shared with me, like, you know, minutes from a prior meeting. And it looked like, so my husband and I are at the same institution and we have the same last name. And it looked like, that they may have intended to invite my husband to be on the committee. <laughs> oh, okay. But... Because when you put emails in for the person to pop up, you put their last name in. And so there's a lot of email confusion that's been going on because of this. Between you, and, between the two of you. And just people will email me when they meant to email him and vice versa. Right. And so I think I like replied yes. And I don't, I've, I'm just speculating, but I could imagine on the other end, they were like, oh, we met her husband, but... Yeah, she's, she's she's good enough. She's good enough. I guess you'll never know, huh? No, no, I kind of don't want to ask either. So, how long is the uh, term on this uh, committee? Unclear. Oh, <laughs> well, you just like broke every rule. I did. I broke every pie. You broke the time pie. You broke the mission pie. You didn't get a clear term. Uh, yes, it's just a, this is a this is a lifetime appointment. Is what it is. So I had an English teacher in high school who said, when you're really good, you can break the rules. What's your point? <laughs> what, what are you trying to I say? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can get away with it till it all comes crashing down. You only have to do it until you're 57, though, right? So. Exactly, because I'm retiring then. <laughs> Tick tock. Yeah. Right. I think that's a wrap. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So you can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at The Effort Report, and you can email us. Our email address is... The effort report at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening.